praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Brother Chuck. Thank you, Brother Dave, Sister Jennifer, Sister Kathy, for leading us in worship today. And I just want to hope and pray that you guys have had a good week. Have you had a good week? All right. That's a question. Yes? No? All right. Well, uh, you know, I've run into uh, some people who have had some big families, and I asked uh, Brian Lee. Uh, he's the one that's going to be uh, Monday through Wednesday helping us with music on our revival on March 13th. But uh, I said, you know, he had just had another grandchild, and I said, well, how many does this make? And I think he told me 21 grandchildren. And I said, brother, I've got two kids, and they make me pray for the rapture. I can imagine. Boy, <laughs> amen. Lord, take me away. Boy. But anyway, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And we got some housekeeping to take care of as you're turning to Jeremiah chapter 1. Uh, we had a beautiful baptismal service uh, down at the bay, down at E.G. Simmons Park uh, last Sunday. Uh, Caitlin Escher uh, was baptized, and we were so excited. Thank you so much for the great turnout. We had such a great time of fellowship. It was so beautiful. The Lord even added an extra bonus as we were in the bay baptizing her. Uh, there was a manatee that was in the water when we first got there, and then I heard a couple dolphins were jumping in the background. Uh, so that's the Lord's extra added blessing. Amen. And uh, has nothing to do with the power of salvation, though. It's all Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask Miss Caitlin to come and receive her uh, certificate, and I want you to uh, just rejoice in her decision to follow the Lord, which is the greatest decision that anyone can ever make. Amen. And that's the greatest assignment in life. Amen. There you go. Now, I, I told her she's going to have to give a speech today. No, I didn't. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. God bless you. All right. That's what I should do to my son, Dave. All right, Dave, come up here and preach. No, I'm just kidding. You got to have God's calling, amen? And right now he's telling me he doesn't, but I don't know. I don't know. We're looking. We're waiting. We're seeing. But uh, you know that last Sunday we had preached on uh, Jeremiah, and we're looking at God's you know, appointment for your life. God has a, a placing or a commissioning in your life, and we're looking at what that commissioning involves. You know, What does his calling involve? What does that look like? You know, how do we unpack that? Because his calling comes with all of his provisions, but we want to see what those provisions are and how the Lord works with us when we give him excuses, when we find ourselves just not motivated, we find ourselves having a pity party, or we're just not where we need to be. You know, God's promises, God's calling in our life, he's the one that's going to motivate you. He's the one that's going to supply everything that you need. So let's look at that so that God's calling isn't so uh, scary. Uh, because, you know, a lot of times people, you know, the old saying is that if I get saved, God's going to call me to Africa. You know, that was big in our generation. I remember actually thinking things like that. Well, I don't want to go there. Boy, so there's a lot of that still out there today, believe it or not. And God's calling, as we learn, uh, comes with a lot of things. So that's what we want to look at. Uh, before we dive into that, I, so let me just say something on March 13th for the revival. Man, if you could come, the greatest way that you can encourage me, encourage one another, and also, man, and be a blessing to the Lord. And that's what we want to be. We know we ask him to bless us, but we also want to be a blessing to him as well. Let me encourage you to come if you can, be here. Let me encourage you to invite a friend. You know, we are in a war. You know, Billy Sunday, the late great preacher, uh, thousands were saved. A guy came up to him and said, you know, man, revivals cost a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of effort. And, uh, and they're just so short-lived. And so Billy Sunday looked back at him and said, well, so is taking a bath, but it does you a whole lot of good. Amen? And that's what revivals are. We need our spiritual batteries recharged. We need to, man, have our uh, toes stepped on. And we need to be woke up. We need to have areas of our lives examined and checked to make sure that we are all walking in the will of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. And I remember there was a story out of Dallas where they did a revival and they spent lots of money and only one person got saved, lots of time, lots of effort. So they had a little powwow afterwards, I heard. And, uh, and they were going through about, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't. It's too much. It's this. It's that. You know, oh, oh they're, they're, they're revivals are things of the past and yada, yada, yada. I got news for you. God's word is sufficient, period. Amen? God's word is sufficient. That's all you need is to preach the word of God. And the God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to save those who will believe, the Bible says. Amen? So we need to preach the word. But a lot of churches are not doing that. And a lot of churches are not having revivals. In fact, I asked Mike Kahn, our associational director here of Tampa Bay, how many churches are doing revivals out of the 154 churches that we have in our association? And, man, he shocked me. 
There's only two churches doing revivals, our church and Ottawa Wild Baptist Church. That's it. Guys, revivals work, man. God's word is sufficient. God has not changed. God is busting at the seams to want to revive and save people. Amen? When I, when I, when I come up here and pray to preach and ask God's power, you know, God, God wants me to preach with his power more than I want to preach with his power myself. God wants people saved more than you ever could. Amen? God wants to move. God wants to revive. So let me encourage you to be a part of that revival, March 13th through the 16th at our church. Because we're in a war. We're in a battle. And sometimes people forget that. Just like Jeremiah uh, tried to give the Lord excuses. Just like Moses tried to give the Lord excuses. But look at what was at stake. Look at the calling of these two men. Jeremiah preached for 40 years and not one convert. Church growth books today would say Jeremiah was a failure as a preacher and yet the word of God says he was a great success because he did what God told him to do you see it's not your job to save people it's the Lord's job to save people it's our job to pray for them and witness them and tell them about the word of God but it's the power of God and the Holy Spirit that does the rest amen so we have revivals also to help you Maybe you're fearful. Maybe, man, you feel like you, you're just a little rusty when it comes to sharing Christ. Or maybe there's just certain things you struggle with. That's why we have revivals. Because as a pastor, it gives you one more tool, one more platform to say, hey, you know, I may not be very good at sharing the, the, the gospel, but I'm trying. But, man, I know if I can bring my friend, my family member to church, they're going to hear the gospel here in its entirety so that they can come and experience the greatest relationship they ever can or ever could. And that's with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Or their sins could be forgiven. Their eternity will be set and sealed forever in heaven with the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So let me encourage you to be a big part of that if you can. And, uh, and to pray for that. And let me encourage you also not to do random acts of kindness for your friends and neighbors. But do intentional acts of kindness for your friends and neighbors. Do something kind. Pray that God will use that kindness to water their heart, to soften their heart. Whatever excuses they may have for not coming to church, ask God to break all those barriers down. You see, you guys are at a great age. You're at that precious age where people like myself and my wife like to hang out with you guys. So you're at that age where if you ask young people to come to revival, chances are they'll be more likely to say yes than they would if a young couple were to ask another young couple to come to revival. Now, I know there's a lot of people in our country that don't respect older people. The Word of God says that a, a young person should, should arise in the Old Testament when the aged walk into a room. God has much respect for older people, amen? And so, so there's a lot of people still out there that do. So let me encourage you to use that. Ask God to use that and take, that, take it for advantage. Like, hey, Lord, let me bring them here so they can hear the gospel, amen? Well, that's on my heart and mind. We are in a battle. We are in a war. And... Unfortunately, the children of Israel were not only at war with Egypt that was down south, and they were at war with the Assyrians that were up north. Now, you remember in 722 B.C. that Israel got swallowed up by the Assyrians because of their idolatry, because of all their wickedness. Well, about 100 years go by, and then Nebuchadnezzar was raised up by the Lord, and he swallowed up Judea. And he ransacked the temple. He destroyed Jerusalem. Uh, he took the best of the best, the smartest, the brightest with him, uh, and then uh, took all the supplies back to Babylon. And so this is the setting that we find ourselves in here in Jeremiah. And so you have Judea just about to collapse, just about Nebuchadnezzar, just about to come in there. And God raises up Jeremiah to say, hey, listen, you're going to be my prophet, and you're going to preach to Israel and surrounding nations, and you're going to give them my message. And my message to Israel is that they need to repent. I've sent preacher after preacher after preacher. We've read about that, I believe, in Jeremiah chapter 25. S sending preachers early, rising early in the morning, warning you time after time, but they refused to listen. And he was saying to the people, King Nebuchadnezzar, man, there's, God's raising up a nation against this one. He's going to use it as this chastening rod. Well, Think about me standing up in our country and saying, hey, listen, we need to surrender to, to the people over there in the Middle East. We just need to surrender, and we need to do what they say because that's what God is telling me to tell you. Now, how, how well do you think that message would be received in America today? Well, think about poor Jeremiah. Think about the assignment that God gave him. Well, you talk about a difficult task. You talk about hard plowing. Everybody hating you, not one compliment, not one pat on the back. Not, hey, that was a great sermon today there, Brother Jeremiah. Nothing but 
heartache and misery and mocking and they put him in prison they cast him in pits because he preached the word of god in fact he was so discouraged he said i'm no longer going to preach the word of god and he said but god's word was like a fire in my bones and i could not contain it anymore amen and that's the great awesome thing about god's calling you can't contain the lord inside of your heart amen he's the only one that can fill it but not only does he fill it but then he overflows it amen He overflows it with his abundance, with his provision, with everything that he has, he's given to you. And as you read through Jeremiah chapter 1, you'll learn that God loves us so much and that God loved Jeremiah so much. And yet he even called Jeremiah to a difficult task. He wanted Jeremiah to know, and we can see the Lord is a God of reassurance. Have you ever done something but you kind of doubted? But somebody came along and reassured you that you were doing the right thing or came along and reassured you at the right moment? Isn't reassurance so strong? Doesn't it really truly give you strength and reestablish your hope? Well, God wants you to know this morning that he's not done with you, that he loves you, and that it doesn't matter what age you are. God is fully and totally capable of using you just like he could use a young teenager. Amen? Because Jeremiah was a teenager. Most scholars believe he was around... Uh, anywhere from 16 to maybe 18 years old when God had called him to do this difficult assignment. So you remember as we were moving through this that God's calling in our life was always personal. You know, the Word of God says that he calls his sheep by name, right? Amen? Boy, and he's known of them. So he calls us. His calling is personal. We learned about that last Sunday. Uh, We learned that his calling was always with a purpose. Look at verse 7. Look at the middle of it. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. 2 Timothy 1.9 tells us God called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose. So his calling, we learn, was always with a purpose. God has a purpose and a definite plan for your life, already mapped out even before the world began. He knew every single thing there was to know about you. In fact, Jeremiah says that, that God had uh, talked about mentioning his name in his mother's womb and that he formed him in his mother womb and so god is a god of reassurance and he wants to reassure us today but then we also learn that god's calling creates a panic sometimes in us hey i'm asking you to get up and man share uh, a bit of information some people get terrified about speaking in public that's one of the one of the number one fears in america is speaking in public i remember my first sermon i had an hour's worth prepared and i got done probably in 10 minutes i was so nervous boy son but as you put all those pieces together yes it can create a panic in us and yes it's personal and yes it's with a purpose but you remember though that God's calling is always comforting because God backs up everything that he says with his promises with his power with his presence with all that he is and he has made himself available to you all of you if you know him and all of him is in you if you know him and you've turned from your sin and put your soul trust in the lord jesus christ and him and him alone on calvary's cross for your sins amen and the fact that he was raised from the dead and you've called upon his name and you asked him personally to forgive you if you haven't done that you need to do that today today is the day of salvation the word of god says amen so it's comforting but then we also learn that it's without compromise because he says in verse five before i came as forth out of the womb i sanctified thee i set you apart to be different and so we talked about that and then we also learn that god's calling uh, uh, is comforting is to be without compromise and let me just park right there and let's go to the word of God let's read a little bit and pray let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1 look at, look, at, look, at verse, look at verse number 3 it came also in the days of Jehoiakim the son of Josiah king of Judah unto the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah the son of Josiah king of Judah unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the 5th month then the word of the Lord came unto me, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said to me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand, touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. See, I this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdom to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And let's consider this subject, God's appointment, God's calling in your life. Father, thank you so much for this time that you've given to us. And Lord, I pray now with all my heart that you'll touch me, that you'll use me, and that, Lord, you'll do in me and through me what I cannot muster on my own. You tell us the Spirit of God quickens, but it's the flesh that profits absolutely nothing. So, Lord, I pray that it would be all you today. I pray that your word would go forth in power. You would grant understanding of your word. Lord, anyone here today that's lost, that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that's on their way to hell, I pray that this would be the day that they would repent of their sin, as you tell us in Mark 1, 15, repent and believe the gospel. And that, Lord, they would turn to you and they would call upon your name and ask you personally to save them. You tell us in your word, all those that call upon your name shall be saved. You tell us in your word, Lord, that we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of human works. Baptism, going to church, those things don't save us, Lord. It's you and your shed blood, and we want to praise you. And, Lord, there's one here today that doesn't know you, has not been washed in the blood has not turned from their sins and put all of their trust in you and you alone in your finished work on the cross. I pray that they'll do that very thing today. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God's calling. If you've been born again, God has called you to a task, to serve him, to soldier for him. Guys, never forget that we are in a battle, that we are in a war. And could you imagine, as I was telling that story about Dallas and how they were going on and on about how much revivals cost and, 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 and this and that. Well, there was a guy in the back that stood up. After everybody got done putting down the revival and all the efforts that the people made and how they're no good anymore, one old big boy stood up. Apparently, he was a really big guy. and said, well, I want you to know that I've been praying for my son for over 20 years, and it was my boy that got saved in that revival. What if it was your boy? What if it was your daughter, your grandson, your grandbaby, your wife, your dad, your uncle, your cousin, your nephew that got saved forever, no longer to ever have to bust hell wide open ever again and experience the joys, the unspeakable joy that we have with the relationship with the precious Lord Jesus Christ? You can't put a price on that. I would rather be a church that said hey, not one person got saved at the revival, but I would rather stand before God and say, Lord, I didn't forget that we were in a war for souls, and Lord, we did try, and we were making efforts, and we were striving to do all that we could to get the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ out. I would rather stand before him and say that than say we didn't do anything. Amen? Now, guys, however, in life you can be gun ho but sometimes in life, and God's calling can be very scary. I know it was scary for me when he called me to preach. Boy, I remember having a panic in me and saying, Lord, I, I kind of was like, Jeremiah, I can't do that. How do you put a sermon together? This, that, Lord, you know I hate school. I'm no good at school. I can't, I'm no good at English. I, I mean, on and on I went. And the Lord was like, are you done? Don't worry. You're going to do it anyway, Amen. And, uh, and praise God, though, how he does it. And, man, I tell you what, man, he so encouraged me through this, this, this chapter because he really just breaks it down and unpacks it for you. So he wants you to know that, listen, his, his, his calling is comforting because, listen, he has that eternal purpose already established for you. He's already had every waking moment of your life already planned out for you, every second, every single day to the day you die. In fact, he knows it so well, the Bible says that your very hairs on your head are numbered. And it literally means in the Greek that he, in the Greek, is referring to how many hairs you have on your head the very moment or the very day you die. He knows how many hairs you're going to have. Because he's awesome that way, amen? And so knowing that we have him and knowing that it's the Lord in and through us and knowing that it's him and his ability that's going to accomplish all these things because our talent may appear, be, appear inadequate. And our talent in and of itself, is inadequate. In fact, the Christian life is impossible to live. We need the Lord. Amen? But we have the promises of God when he calls us. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. You see, the touch wasn't so much to purify as it was to inspire and empower. It was a symbolic gesture of the Lord. You know, it was anthropomorphic language. You know, adding body parts to God because, you know, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit is, is not a man. And so we in our infinite minds try to understand him. And so when it says the hand of the Lord was on him, it's called anthropomorphic language. 
And so it's symbolic of saying, hey, listen, I've empowered you. You have my presence. You have my calling. You are going with my authority. And you're going with my purpose, my plan. And my plan and my will will be accomplished. But I want to use you to do it. How awesome is that? Amen? Would you be honored if the Queen of England asked you to do something? I'm sure somebody would put it on Facebook. Amen? Hey, I, I, hey, hey Queen of England asked me to do something today. But man, think about the think about the Lord. He's the one that gave her her position and job. Amen. How much greater is He? Wow. But it's without compromise. Look at verse, Isaiah chapter six says, before uh, he had heard God's official call in his life, before he really heard who will go for us, whom shall I send? You remember that passage in Isaiah six? But isn't it interesting? That before he heard that, he had to get the sin of his life because the Bible says an angel went over to the altar and took a hot coal and touched his lips because he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. He had to get the sin out of his life. He had to confess his sin, turn from his sin for, to be used of the Lord. That's when he heard the call of God in his life. None of us are clean vessels in and of ourselves. We need the Lord to cleanse us. Amen. So was it without compromise? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are only, not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from those things, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, useful for the master's use, prepared unto good works. So God wants your calling to be sanctified. When a waiter comes to your table and had a dirty pitcher, would you want him to pour that into your glass? Well, God wants you to be a clean vessel, too, so that he can pour himself in and out of your life to affect other people's lives for eternity. And we also understand that it's a challenge. So God's calling comes with all those things. But what else does God's calling come with? Well, we looked at God's calling. It's personal. Man, it's always with a purpose. It creates a panic sometimes, but it's comforting. It's without compromise, and it's always going to be challenging. Why? Because the Christian life is impossible. We need the Lord. The Bible says it's the Lord who both wills and works in you to do his good pleasure. Who works in you? To both work and to do his good pleasure. So he gives you the desire to do things for him, but he also gives you the will and ability, but it's God doing it in and through you. That's the awesome thing about it, because even when you feel like quitting, like Jeremiah did, Man, the Lord is in you, and he is going to give you the energy and the willpower and the strength to do what he wants you to do. He will do it, but he's very gracious and kind and patient with us, is he not? He didn't come down and say, Jeremiah, that's the wrong answer. He didn't say that, did he? He was gentle and kind and sweet, and we need, even our kids, you, you've seen how kids sometimes are, they're, they're, that they have trepidation about doing certain things and then dad or mom comes along and gives them that reassurance and boy, they do such a great job. God knows we need reassurance. I need reassurance. If you can see my prayer times, you see a lot of tears sometimes with me pouring out my heart, my pity party. Lord, you know my ability. You know that I'm a very simple person. And if you don't believe me, ask Brother Dave and ask Brother Dan, they'll tell you. Ask Brother Brad. Ask Brother George. Amen. Pray for them. They, they need prayer when they're around me. Please pray for them. Amen. Boy. But he says in verse 9, The Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Philippians 2, 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and do his good pleasure. Wow. I like what uh, A.W. Tozer said. And I quote, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only things we can do by ourselves. Ouch. Boy. I like what Charles Spurgeon said about the power of God when it comes to God's calling in your life. This is what we need to focus on. Not our ability, not ourselves, not our plans, not our desire, not our will, but our will is to live for him. You're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, which is which is his, the Bible says. He's bought you. He's purchased you. He owns you by right of creation. He owns you by right of redemption. If you have turned from sin and you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus and you're saved, he bought you with a price. He owns you lock, stock, and barrel. And he says, glorify God in your body. Boy. But we can't do that. 
without the power of God. I like what Charles Spurgeon said. Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. What did Jesus say? Without me, you can do nothing. But the problem is sometimes we don't believe that. Without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire. We are useless without the Spirit of God touching us. When it comes to a preacher, a preacher, you know those old bell ropes they used to have in some of those old towns still? They pull that rope. Well, you can have the greatest, most awesome sounding bell the world's ever heard, but that bell will sit there dead as a door now until somebody pulls that rope. And our preacher will preach to the air until the Spirit of God pulls his rope. Amen? And so when it comes to that Sunday school class, when it comes to that getting up in front of people, when it comes to serving, when it comes to women's ministry, when it comes to the ministries we have here, when it comes to knocking on doors, when it comes to visitation, when it comes to you serving whatever capacity it may be, man, God wants you to understand that his equipping comes with his power. Amen? And that he loves you today. Boy. How do I know? Look at verse 9. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Who did it? Did Jeremiah do it? You know, when I joined the Air Force, it was interesting to me. Not one time did they say, Hey, where, 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 where's your mama's clothes at? Where's your mama's clothes? Not one time did they say. They, they issued me everything that I needed. A gun, uniform, told me where I needed to be. Told me how to look. Told me where to be. Told me how to march. And a lot of it, of course, is hurry up and wait. If you're in the military, you know what I mean. Amen? Hurry up and wait. Boy, but they gave me everything that I needed. And guess what? When God calls you, you get everything that you need to live life, live your life, and do his will with all your heart. He gives you his power. Wow. And the Bible says the Lord commanded, and it was so. Do you realize that there are 10 times more stars scientists say than there are pebbles of sand on the earth and yet the Bible says the Lord has made every one of them and not one of them is missing from his sight and he's named them all by name every star and there's 10 times more stars what, quote unquote what scientists say than there are pebbles in the sand of the sea how awesome is our God amen boy Wow, he spoke this universe into existence by just the power of his sheer command, the power of his will. Do you think he can motivate you when you need to be motivated? Amen? Boy. If he can open up the Red Sea, which was nothing to him, if you think about our earth and how small we are from, 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 from the advantage of outer space, I mean, we're, we're just like a dust ball and we're just like dust mites on top of it of how small we really are compared to how awesome he made everything, how big he made everything. Incredible is power. And the Bible says nothing shall be impossible with God. You know, there was a boy on, a, on, a, on an airplane, and uh, he was uh, going to go see his grandparents, and there would happen to be a preacher, a professionary, seminary uh, professor on plane that sat next to him, and the kid had a Sunday school take-home article, and so he was reading it, so the professor noticed it and said, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a big red shiny apple if you can tell me what one thing I can do. And the kid thought about it for a moment, true story, and said, well, I'll tell you what, mister, if you can tell me what God can't do, I'll give you a whole barrel of apples. He had the right spirit, amen? Now, we praise God that he can't lie, he can't sin, there are certain things that God can't do, but the spirit of that boy had it right, Amen? Boy, he sure did. He and we have God's power. Boy, we have his power. The Bible says where the word of the king is, there is power. The Bible says nothing shall be impossible with God. Nothing. But not only does he equip us with his power, but he also equips us with his presence. How awesome is that? Look at verse 8. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with thee. Don't be afraid of whatever it is you're about to do. I am with thee, the Lord says. No matter what that is, I'm with you. I've already got it planned out, mapped out, and figured out. All you have to do is surrender to me. Easier said than done, though, ain't it? Boy. Let me ask you this. If, if, if I'm in the woods, and there's a big grizzly bear that's about to maul both of us, and your gun jams, 
And your gun's a Smith & Wesson. But my gun is a different brand. Is my gun being a different brand going to bother you? Are you at that moment going to care who gets the credit, who kills the bear? You don't care. But I know one thing that's in your heart. Hey, my gun's jammed, but you know what? The presence of that other rifle is giving me peace. And the presence of, and the power of that rifle, man, is going to help us be protected. And so just merely having somebody else there and having that rifle in their hand can do a lot for a situation when it comes to people panicking. Amen? Now, how much more when you find yourself in difficult situations, tough situations, painful situations, how much more is the Lord going to be there to pick you up and hold you and support you? You know, when my kids get in trouble, the one thing that I want to do is come to their rescue. I want to see them do right. I want to see them do well. I don't want to, I don't want to see them worse. I want to build them up. So when we find ourselves in trouble, when we find ourselves feeling like, man, I'm on the shelf and I just feel used up. Uh, I'm not doing as much as I used to do when I was young. And, Lord, I, I just don't think I'm doing anything for you. But, man, your life, your integrity, your character, all of those things matter. I was telling somebody the other day, one of the most precious gifts and jewels in a church is unity. A dear sister here I was telling this to. You know, and this dear sister said, well, you know, sometimes we just feel like we don't do a whole lot, you know. And I said, just, just the fact that you're saved, you've got the Spirit of God, you allow Him to be in control of your life, that right there does so much for a church. That by itself, it keeps unity because people like that are biblical. They want unity based on the Bible, not based on their opinion or what somebody else said. That does a lot. Unity, even though it's quiet, even though you can't really see it, a lot of activity, but boy, unity is a precious thing, is it not? I told my kids we were out in the woods the other day. I said, stop for a second. What do you hear? Well, we can hear a lot. And yet it's so quiet, it's almost deafening, it's loud. I said, but did you notice all these trees and all these things around us, they, they grow in silence. You don't see them shaking. You don't see fruit trees grunting and straining their branches to pop out fruit. Now they're resting in something. It's called a vine. Amen? And Jesus is the vine. The Holy Spirit is the sap. And we are the branches. We also need to rest in him and allow his power to motivate us. And you've got to be honest with the Lord. Lord, like Jeremiah, hey, Jonah was honest, was he not? Lord, didn't I tell you before I even went to that country? I knew you were a gracious God. I knew you were merciful. I knew you were slow to anger. And here you are doing what you said you're going to do. And it irritated them. Boy. Well, I tell you what. You, you, you can be irritated with the Lord. You can be angry. I can see that. I can see where people get hurt and say, if God loves me, why is this going on? Why is that going on? I, I can see even questions coming that way. But we've got to go to the cross. And look back at the cross and realize Jesus was perfectly innocent. And if anyone deserved a great life and a big house and all these things that people clamor for, it would have been him. And yet he was crucified for loving people perfectly. Wow. Man, but guys, we have his protection. Don't be afraid of their faces, for I'm with thee to deliver thee. How many times have you told your kids or grandkids not to be afraid? And we need to hear the Lord say that to us. We need his reassurance. And let me tell you, he is every day. Every time you turn to Jeremiah chapter 1, his word is just as fresh as it was yesterday. His word was just as fresh, and it will be just as fresh every other day in eternity. And my friend, when you read Jeremiah chapter 1, you can get encouraged. I know it's encouraged me. But God's quibbing not only comes with his power and his presence and his protection, but it also comes with his promises. Look at verse 12. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I, have, I, I, I will hasten my word to perform it. And God did exactly what he said he was going to do to Jeremiah. Nebuchadnezzar was raised up and swallowed up Judea because they did not listen to God's preacher. And God said, fine, I'm done sending preachers. Now you will listen to my persecutor, but you're going to listen either way. Boy, and they did. God's promises are better than, than, than Fort Knox. Man, you get into his word, you look at all that God's promises can do for you and will do for you. 
Man, they give you guidance. They give you discretion. They give you discernment. They give you hope. They give you strength. They give you insight. And God promises he will fulfill every single thing he says he's going to call you to do. But you've got to allow him to do it in you and through you. He's a gentleman. He doesn't put a chain on us and force us to do what he wants us to do. The greatest promise in all the Bible is I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. And guys, let me just end with this. Let me wrap this up. We've seen God's calling. We've seen God's quipping. But I want you to see God's enabling. God equips, but he also enables you to do what he's called you to do. He's enabled you to face what you're facing. He's enabled you to defeat that giant that may be looking down on you right now. That's got you in a tizzy. God's enabling. Look at verse 12. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. So I put it in your mouth. I equipped you. But now, Jeremiah, I am going to empower you to do what I say to do. Wow. I'm going to enable you. I'm going to equip you to do it. And what is he going to go and equip him to do? Well, look. Look at... Number one, he's going to equip him to do his work. But the Lord said unto me, I am not a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. So he's equipping us to do his work. Just like he equipped Jeremiah, he's equipping you to do his work. John chapter 14, verse 12, Truly I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was going to come and enable us to do exactly what Jesus could do. And Jesus does in us and through us only what he can do. He lives the life that you and I can't live called the Christian life. It's the great exchange. He took our sin on Calvary's cross into his body, as the Bible says. He he took our wrath on Calvary's cross and was forsook by God the Father so that you and I could be forgiven. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. Jesus says, repent, turn from sin, put your trust in him, call upon him, and receive his forgiveness receive all that he is receive all of his power all of his love all that he has for you today but when he does save you he's going to call you to work for him you're going to serve him amen but he's going to be the one doing it in and through you we need to be reminded of that sometimes that's why we have excuses because we focus on ourselves our own ability not on his it's easy to get lost in that but number two and i'm done But God also enables us to witness for him. You are a witness 24-7. The moment you got saved, you're a witness. You're either a good one or you're going to be a bad one. But you're a witness. You can't turn that off. The light's either on or off. A woman's either pregnant or not. You're either serving the Lord or you're not. You're either obeying the Lord or you're not. You're doing his will or you're not. But we're to witness for him. God commands us to witness. Verse 9, God put his words in Jeremiah's mouth. Why? Because he sent him forth to go preach the message look at verse 7 God said whatever I command thee thou shalt speak so Jeremiah was a witnessing machine for 40 years and none of them listened to the Lord through him Acts chapter 1 verse 8 but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you you shall be witnesses unto me to the uttermost parts of the earth look at verse 10 see I have this day set thee over the nations over the kingdoms to root out to pull down to destroy and to throw down notice now to build and to plant jeremiah's message was one of judgment but jeremiah's message was also one of great mercy and grace and hope i know the plans that i have for you says the lord to give you a hope to give you a future that's out of jeremiah but it was in the context of the children of israel being in a place in a foreign land under a foreign king who was a pagan in a very difficult time in their life and he was saying listen when you submit to the king of Nebuchadnezzar you can read in Jeremiah when you submit to the king of Nebuchadnezzar I'm going to prosper you you submit to what he says do what I tell you and I'm going to get you through this captivity and that's exactly what God did he'll get you through your captivity too amen because I'm telling you I'm being honest with you. I really have times where I cry and say, God, why you, know, why you call me to be a pastor? Why you call me to be a pastor? When there's so many other people that have so many other talents and abilities, and that's where God's like, stop. Where's your focus? It's not on me. But when I get it back on him, boy, he encourages my heart. Man, he gave me a verse the other day and just put a tear in my eye. And I was so burdened about some things about different things going on and 
just worried about this, that, and the other. And, man, I was giving it to the Lord. And, man, he just gave me a verse. Man, it just filled my heart with his peace and his presence. And he took that panic away. And he'll do it for you, too. He'll do it for you, too. He loves you with all of his heart. Amen? And no matter what you do for the Lord, how small or how big, a cup of water in his name's not forgotten. You've heard my lug nut illustration. You never hear anyone compliment lug nuts on a car, but boy, they're so important, are they not? I'll be a lug nut for God any day, amen, if he'll allow me to. Can I read you one story? I know I've gone longer than I wanted, but I've got to read this story because it's, it's, it's like the heart, it's the heart of what Jeremiah chapter 1 is and how to have true success with the Lord. Can I, can I read you a story just really, really, really quick? When J. Wilbur Chapman, he was an evangelist in America, was in London, he had an opportunity to meet General Booth, the gentleman that founded the Salvation Army, who at the time was past 80 years of age. Dr. Chapman listened very reverently as the old general spoke of the trials and conflicts and the victories. Then the American evangelist asked the general if he would disclose his secret for success. He hesitated a second, Dr. Chapman said, and I saw tears come into the general's eyes and go down his cheek and then he said I will tell you the secret God has had all there was of me there have been men with me greater with greater brains than I men with greater opportunities but the day that I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth there was and if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it's because God has, God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. And I like what this evangelist said after General Booth made that statement to him. He said this as he contemplated what he was saying. Dr. Chapman said he went away from this meeting with General Booth knowing, and I quote, the greatness of that man's power is in the measure of how much he surrenders to the Lord Jesus Christ in his life. And that's the truth. You take rocks out of a glass, that water goes down. You put rocks in it, it overflows. Those rocks could be our own agenda, our own thing, our own strength, our own power. We need all of God's power. And it's available to us, amen? And it's available to you. I love you, and he loves you with all of his heart. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Thank you for your extra patience today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As the piano begins to play, I'm going to ask you a question. If Jesus were to come into this room and open up his book of life and say, I'm going to read every name in this book, would your name be mentioned in that book? Do you have Bible assurance that you know that you're going to heaven when you die? Eternity is too long for you to be wrong. God's given us an open book test. And he wants us to pass the greatest test of life, and that's the test of eternal life. Has there been a time in your life where you truly repented of your sin? You confess to the Lord that you're a sinner. The Bible tells us for all have sinned and fallen short of his glory, and that the wages of sin is death and hell, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible says he took all your sin, past, present, and future, and he bore it in his body. And he died in the sinner's place, your place, on Calvary's cross. God's wrath fell on him so that it wouldn't fall on you. All of it. And the Bible says that he died, he was raised from the dead. And the Bible says all those that call upon his name shall be saved. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever lied? Don't, 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 don't answer out loud. What do you call someone that lies? A liar. How many times do they have to lie before they're a liar? One time. So if you've ever lied one time in your life, God says you're a liar. Sir, ma'am, have you ever disobeyed your parents one time? God says you're dishonorable to your parents. Sir, have you ever looked at a woman to lust after her in your heart? Man, the word of God says we committed the adultery in our heart already. So if you just take those three sins and you die without the blood of Jesus, because 1 John 1, 7 says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. He's going to look at you on judgment day and say, you're a lying, thieving, adulterer. Does that sound like a good person to you? Because that's exactly how God's going to see you on that day. He's not comparing you to anybody else on judgment day. He's comparing you to his son, Jesus Christ, who is perfect and holy. 
And that's why we all fall short and we need his righteousness. And when you turn from your sin and give your heart to Jesus, he in exchange as he took your sin on Calvary's cross will give to you his perfect righteousness as a gift. And he'll wrap that perfect righteous robe around you and permanently give that to you so he'll no longer see you as a condemned sinner, but he'll see you as a saint that's fit for heaven. So I'm asking you today, have you been a time in your life where you've turned from sin and truly put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If you're here today saying, I'm trusting in baptism, plus Jesus, you'll not go to heaven. If you're in here today saying, I'm trusting in my church membership, plus Jesus, you'll not go to heaven. It is Jesus plus nothing is salvation. Jesus plus anything you add to it is damnation. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father except through me, Jesus said. There is salvation found in, in no other. There's been no other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved, the Bible says. So I'm asking you, about your eternity because you're going to spend it either in heaven or hell do you have Bible assurance today because the word of God tells us in Romans 8 16 the spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God he wants you to know that you're saved it's not a hope so a think so salvation it's a no so salvation these things I've written unto you that you may know you have eternal life do you know that you have eternal life today I want you to pray this prayer with me if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He's calling you to repent and give your heart to him, and he'll forgive you. He'll change your life. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, behold, he's a new creation. Old things pass away, all things become new. If you want to pray and get saved, pray, that, pray this prayer to yourself. And you, These words don't save you. Jesus saves you. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I cannot save myself. I believe that you died on the cross for all my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that God raised you from the dead. And I'm calling upon your name, Lord. And I'm asking you to forgive me, a sinner. And I'm willing to turn from all my sin. Forgive me. Save me. Change my life forever. If you prayed that today and you were sincere... I'll not call on you, I'll not embarrass you, but I want you to raise your hand and say, Brother Dave, I prayed to receive Christ for the first time in a real way today because I want to make sure that my sins are forgiven and I have heaven as my home. Raise your hand right now and say, Brother Dave, I prayed that. I'll not call on you, I'll not embarrass you, but I just want a record of your hand so I can be praying with you. Anybody at all? All right, church. We're in a battle for souls. We have family, we have friends, we have associates, we have neighbors. What are we doing? Maybe some of you in here today want to come forward and just, just say, Lord, you know what? I just need your touch. I just need to be refreshed. Thank you for the reminder, Lord. Help me get my mind off of me. And Lord, let me once again get it back on you. He'll love you. He loves you today and he'll help you with that. But whatever's on your heart and mind, these altars are going to be open. Maybe there's somebody been praying about joining a church and you've been seeking a church and, and you may know that the Lord's called you here to use your gifts and calling here. I can come forward and I can tell you how you can be a part of our church. But whatever it is, come. Don't leave this place not doing business with the Lord. This is his time and your time. Come. If everyone would stand right now, we're going to sing him. 317. 317. This is your time and his time. Come. Don't leave here unchanged today. This is your time and his. mind's clear. I want to personally say thank you to everyone for giving me a little extra time today. I, I try to honor the time I do, but sometimes the Spirit of God just moves in you. Amen? Well, that was a good amen, boy. Man, I'm just, I'm just going to go leave right now. Boy, son. Amen? Amen. amen. Alright, I'm going to ask Brother David if he'll close us in prayer. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, my dear sister, come. Yes, indeed. This is very important, guys. I'm cutting into her time, so she's probably mad at me, so pray for her. I just want to take this opportunity to explain to some of the women here what our women's ministry is all about. Uh, the next meeting is this Friday at 1 o'clock, the noon hour, and it's called the Oxford Street. Your mic is still turned on. Okay, I'm loud enough, I think. <laughs> but it's more than a Bible.
Bible study. It's actually a time of fellowship. It's a time for us to take the owner's manual here, the Word of God, and apply it to our lives as women. And so our study uh, this month is going to be on the lives of Rachel and Naomi and Ruth. And Renee Cochran and I have put together a program for us to meet discuss the Word of God, but more than a study, it's going to be an application to our lives as women. The issues we face, the issues the women of the Bible faced, and how they dealt with that. So it's a chance for us to fellowship and get to know one another better, and to serve the Lord in the best way that each of us has. All of us have gifts. God's given every one of us gifts, and unless we share those gifts, it's like putting a light under a bushel. So please, Join us, bring your friends, your family, your neighbors. Let's get together and get to know one another better over refreshments and refreshing our souls. I believe that together we can help each other in times of need. A lot of you have prayer needs that maybe you're not comfortable to bring up in a group. But in a small group of women, you're comfortable to share those needs, those prayer requests. So please come, join us. We need you. We need your gifts. So it's this, it's every first Friday of the month at 1 o'clock here in the church.